we are going to get into some more Delphi, the shenanigans in Delphi. Mm. Um, you know, just take a minute to remember justice for the victims and their families, Abby and Libby, as all of this ridiculousness is going on. And apparently the destruction of evidence is what is alleged in a new motion filed by the defense. It's very interesting. We're going to get into that in a minute. But first, I wanted to say that, of course, Judge Gold made a judgment on the motion to disqualify. And her judgment was, I'm not disqualifying myself and I'm not giving you an explanation other than the Indiana Supreme Court unanimously denied the defendant's previous request on January 18th, which is interesting. Because she filed this before the Supreme Court's written ruling ever came out. And she cites the Supreme Court's decision on it like she knew something. So I have an article here by Fox 59, and it's literally entitled, Delphi Murderer's Judge Denies Motion to Disqualify, citing Indiana Supreme Court's prior ruling. And that whole ruling hadn't even come out yet. They hadn't even described why they didn't give him relief on disqualifying the judge, uh, which that ruling has since came out. Um, and it sounds like essentially like the basic rundown is that judge goal messed up. She shouldn't have gotten rid of the lawyers, um, that, 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 was not okay. And it did, they did feel like procedurally that the writ of mandamus was justified in the situation and that, you know, they granted relief. We all saw it. But as far as the judge, they did understand the judge's concerns with the leaked evidence um, and the issues she had with the defense attorneys. They, they said that they believed that she was right to be concerned about those things but the issue is how she, what she did about it. She could have done, you know, Hennessy, the guy, the lawyer that represented um, Baldwin and Rosie and actually is going to be representing them in the hearing that's upcoming about um, the contempt of court stuff the state has alleged against the defense attorneys. He's uh, filed his representation for them. Um he even said, you know, you could dock their pay. You could do anything. You could do anything to, you know, reprimand, hold them accountable for that situation. It was just such an extreme measure to do what she did. Too extreme. Yeah. So their justification essentially was nothing proved she was biased. And that she was right to be concerned. It was just the action she took wasn't justified. But so they didn't see it as enough to disqualify her. Yeah, I I just don't agree. I don't agree. Well, you and know, maybe they didn't present the same arguments. I I'm I I watched that hearing, uh, and I don't remember if I'm pretty sure the newest document that we went over last week had more. Uh, details in it around her bias it than they presented. I think it did too, and I wondered why because I they well because more has hap more has happened, you know, like that has all concluded. So they have more like she right after that when they got reinstated, she just denied all of their motions off the bat, which is insane, and with no hearings on any of it. I think the fact that she's including the prosecution should that alone by itself should be enough to remove her and that's she, not okay. Yeah. So she hasn't ruled or, um, done anything about the, um, the allegations the defense has made against the prosecutor so far. Um, which is interesting, but anyway, let's, let's get to the new stuff that has come out. I swear there's new stuff constantly. Like I can't even keep up with it at this point anymore. Um, it's just, it's too much, but, uh, there's a new motion and have it right here. It is motion to dismiss for destroying exculpatory evidence. And essentially 
what they are going over is that there were interviews with Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall um, within like the first week of the murders. They were on to Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall like a week into the murders, which is insane. It's so interesting. And I, I'm so curious how they connected those dots, but think that there's not any continued worth in looking. Yeah. So, so let's, let's get into it. Um, so they're, they're incorporating some of what they put in the Frank's memorandum into this. So in discovery, the defense found a document dated February 17th. 2017 that appears to be an FBI report memorializing an interview of Brad Holder contained within the document are these words. The below is an interview summary. It is not intended to be a verbatim account and does not memorialize all statements made during the interview. Communications by the parties in the interview room were electronically recorded. The recording captures the actual words spoken. Uh, which is is really okay okay not mm -hmm. so the summary doesn't include all words right. so what do you think happens next obviously they're going to request the actual recording because it says it was recorded right, right. So also in the discovery, the defense found a document dated February 19th, 2017 that memorializes a, a interview with Patrick Westfall too. The report itself does not indicate whether the interview was recorded, although the defense would expect, because it's standard procedure, that it would have been. So after they got the document, they saw a copy of the recording, of course, because they want to see what was said. And in the Franks memo, we know that they there was many allegations against these men, several men, but they were two of the most important. Because there's even statements by Brad Holder's ex that... Patrick Westfall was that Brad told her, Holder told her that he absolutely did have something to do with the Delphi murders and the Flora murders, and that if she didn't stop asking questions, she was going to get killed. Whoa. Yeah. So, I mean, clearly this is of utmost importance to these defense attorneys considered this is the direction they're going. They truly believe that people who had onus beliefs had something to do with this. Um, so they sought the recording and they wanted to see exactly what Brad Holder said because it's clearly vital to the case. They need to see if there's any statements that where he's lying. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I get it. They need to vet everything. Like, I, I feel like that's pretty obvious. Um, so they requested it. On September 8th, 2023, the prosecutor communicated in a letter there were no audio or video interviews of Brad Holder or Patrick Westfall available. McClelland offered no explanation as to why they didn't exist. Before the defense had an opportunity to do anything about it, because clearly they were uh, kicked off the case, and McClelland asked for the disqualification of them. And then Judge Gohl was like, yeah, I, I want to do that. I do want to kick them off the case. And then she did do it. Um, they couldn't look into it. Mm. So then January 31st, this year, 2024, they were reinstated and the prosecution handed over discovery to the defense, including which I saw some people asking, wait, how did they not see this in the discovery before? Well, because they were reinstated and they were handed up over some new stuff. I feel like that's obvious. Yeah. Including a letter, cattle, and even if they hadn't gone through every bit of discovery before this, so? Yeah. Like, it takes a long I don't think time. think it matters, yeah. Including a letter cataloging the evidence that the prosecutor was turning over to the defense contained on contained on page five, paragraph five of the itemi itemization of the discovery are words that explain Brad Holder's missing videotaped interview and Patrick Westfall's. And I, I quote, 
Due to a DVR program error discovered on 9-20-2017, so that's months later after the murders, a few months, Mm -hmm. all recordings up to February 20th, 2017, were recorded over. There is no detectable audio found on this drive. No way. Remember, Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall were interviewed during this very short window from February 14th to February 20th within days of the murders. The videotaped interviews were deleted by the police. They, they stated that very blatantly, you guys. <laughs> it is unknown that what other interviews were deleted during the relevant time frames. The destruction Whoa. of this material... Uh, interviews of key suspects early in the ve- investigation demonstrates negligence, if not intentional mis- intentional conduct, misconduct, I assume, yeah. on, this, on the part of the state. How could law enforcement, while investigating the most serious of crimes, record <clears throat> over interviews of material suspects with recklessness or intentionality with a question mark? That's interesting. So they're leaving it like it's either complete recklessness and negligence and incompetence or they did it on purpose. Yeah. I th- look who what's weird to me is that the FBI was involved in this and the FBI is the one who wrote the Odinus report. So did somebody from the local department mess with the FBI's files? I don't see the FBI deleting interviews like that. Yeah, but I would I gotta and think tw- about this for a in second. In twenty seventeen with a DVR, like DVR, what does that mean? It it means it's internal uh storage. Okay. Digital video video recording program. Digital video recording program. Okay. Uh, so I'm assuming it's hooked up to a computer that it's not like, oh, turn on the CD burner and let's get that camera going. It's it's the in, the output is going directly to a computer where they can store that. So how how it like records over. I I have no idea. It doesn't Computers make, don't work like that. No, it doesn't make sense. They create sense. a new file. Exactly. It doesn't make sense. And it's funny that everything up till February 20th is gone. And they didn't discover it until what the... So that's September, right? Yes. Nine, nine something. That's the month of September. So what, they didn't go looking for the video recordings of these interviews until September? Why? Why did they not notice it right away? And why did they not try to remedy it by bringing them back in to talk to them again? It's really weird. Um, Also, how did they write a summary without the video or audio? Because if oh, I that's a really good point. Yeah. I'm curious when that summary was written then. That would be my next question. Yeah, how was that summary written? What date was that written? Like that matters. Or did they literally write it throughout the time they were talking to them? But you wouldn't normally do that because it's an audio. No, like you know it's, it's being, being recorded. recorded. Yeah. They're not gonna be writing. That's a summary happen. is normally Based off the audio, like you're not, there's no way a police officer is doing that completely off of memory. Especially not if you talk to them for a few hours, like you are not doing that off memory. So I feel like it had to be, they had to do it based off of the audio. I don't, that's just really strange to me. Um, It is strange. I don't understand it. strange too. I I mean, I, I think they're right to question the intentions or, um. What was behind this? So, as a material part of the defense, Richard Allen is expected to direct attention towards Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall as being involved in the murders of these two young victims. So that's interesting that they literally give us a clue. Like, this is where we're going with this. We believe these men had something to do with it. 
Like that's very clearly stated here, which is kind of wild to me. Like they're all throwing it out on the table, which I feel like is not typical uh, for defense attorneys. Um, and that Richard Allen didn't know them, so he had nothing to do with it. Uh, this destroyed videotaped interview of these two men, if it ever existed, was expected to contain evidence that could provide exculpatory um, and material evidence in support of the defense. If a recording of Westfall was ever secured, that too is a purposeful or ne negligent failure to preserve material and exculpatory evidence. So basically, if they didn't record Westfall's interview, that's also a problem, which I agree. Um, they basically just say, like, recording an interview is significant. Like, it's really important, which I agree, which is why in the Idaho 4 case, we question why there's only the FBI's recording and none other that we know about. Like, it's really strange, too. Um, but uh, I want to get to the warrants. Because they also, well, wait, we have to talk about what Brad Holder said. So the state actions have deprived the defense from the ability to compare Brad Holder's words from only three days after the crime to evidence that was unearthed over the next years, you know. Um, and they do say here that they did find an inconsistency in Brad Holder's statements because they did pull Brad Holder in in 2023 to re-interview him, which is interesting. Yeah. So, um, on August 30th, 2023, following depositions in which the state of Indiana and law enforcement learned the defense believed Brad Holder to be an actor in the murders, law enforcement finally re-interviewed Holder. Since 2017, they never pulled him back in until 2023 when the defense put out that memorandum is when the law enforcement finally pulled them back in. I mean, it, it, it feels like negligence. Yeah. So in the memorialized report in 2017, uh, Brad Holder said he never met Abigail w Williams, Abby Williams, who supposedly dated his son, right? He claimed he never met her. Well, on 20, in 2023, his story changed um, when he talked to law enforcement. He said, and it says, at the 39, oh, 39 minutes and nine seconds mark, I barely even knew that girl. I met her once. When he claimed back then, right after the murders, three days after the murders, that he had never met her. Shady. Really shady. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's a huge contradiction. Why would you deny meeting her if she was dating your son and you weren't involved? Why wouldn't you say that? Why? Well, I, I didn't really know her. You know, my son was dating her, but I only met her one time. Like that's saying I never met her once is highly suspicious to me. That, that guy is just suspicious. He is incredibly suspicious. This is a guy who had <laughs> pictures on his Facebook, literally like pictures of that looks so much like the crime scene that it's disturbing and shocking before that information ever came out to the public. Yeah. Like early on within the same year that it happened, like within months, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it also discovered from former Rushville police officer, Todd click, uh, reached out to prosecutor McClelland in an attempt to bring to his attention, the existence of an 85-page report summarizing the investigation that revolved around Brad Holder, Westfall, and other affiliates. Um, the letter landed on McLeland's desk May 1st, 2023, and was not discovered to the defense for more than four months later, September 8th, 2023. And only after the defense disclosed uh -huh. its depositions and that they were aware of Odinist ties to the crime scene investigation. So once they started deposing people, then McLean was like, okay, here, here's the Odin report. <laughs> the failure that's to discuss that is ridiculous. It absolutely is. Um, so clearly that's a problem. Um, so there's also about the professor's statements. We already know about the Purdue professor and how 
they it, it's apparent it was a lie, you know, them saying they couldn't find him and that he said there was no evidence of like Odinus, anything Odinus there uh, at the crime scene. But clearly he did not say that. He yeah. did agree that there was signs of like some kind of Odinus nature to the crime. There is, but it's interesting to highlight that there's still to this day uh, people that are looking at this case and they're like, you guys are crazy. There's no way that racist Odinists that believe in the, the, I almost did something to make fun of them, but if it was snipped, it would have looked really bad. But uh, there's no way that racist Odinists that are all white power um, would end two white girls. Oh, not true. That That is not true. And we gave a ton of evidence covering this topic from a bunch of different cases where they've ended white people. Yeah, it's, the gang that is involved yeah. with the Odinistic beliefs, yeah. and yes, if they were involved with somebody that was of color, they or doing something they didn't like. Yep, yep. Murderous individuals are going to murder. Okay, yes. It, <laughs> they may have like separate reasons for murdering separate different kinds of people, but I mean, come on. It if they can so murder anybody, that- they anybody they can murder anybody it just so happens that they have a flag they can fly their horrible actions under and and try to justify them correct yeah so listen to this cell phone guy Hmm. in more recent discovery defense also located a prepared search warrant application to at&t for data contained on brad holders and Patrick Westfall's mobile devices. Each application states that Holder Westfall is a known member of a religious sect and elements of the murders have potential religious significance. Okay, this was drafted back then in 2017. These search warrants were drafted and said this. Um, The information being requested is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. There's no evidence the that the warrant was ever served. Also, the defense has not located any sect. Like it's very obvious connections with a gang. Yeah, I know. Uh, There is no evidence that the warrant was ever served. Also, the defense has not located any discovery regarding any data contained on holders or Westfall's 2017 phones or any other electronic devices. It defies logic that law enforcement would conduct forensic examinations of so many other phones in this investigation, yet ignore the phones of Holder and Westfall, who were viewed as suspects within three days of the murders and interviewed by law enforcement. And then they prepared search warrants for the phones and never served them. Is that not bewildering? Yes. So then they asked for a hearing. Uh, Because they want to present this evidence and talk about it in court. Um, I don't believe there's been a response to that yet. Um, I know there's the upcoming hearing about their own contempt of court. Um, So I'm sure Judge Gull wants to try to, you know, kick him off the case again, if she can, before anybody has to answer any of these questions. (laughs) Yeah. But clearly, she got two new defense attorneys and they saw the same problems. So kicking what does kicking them off the case do? I mean, I'm not confident in them. In who? The two new defense attorneys. I'm talking about Rosie and Bald Rosie and Baldwin. Oh, what does oh, kicking oh, them yeah. off have anything to do with anything? How is that going to help? Because the new attorneys that are now the not uh, they're you know the defense team anymore they stepped down after Baldwin and Rosie were reinstated um they saw the same problem that's my point is i don't know if i trust those two oh okay that they so, were going along with it I think for that, some other motives yes and i think that uh it could be with the intent of trying to get them kicked off again and them being willing to pass the torch like oh these guys back what we're saying then it's done right i see what you're saying i mean i, I... that's some tin hat stuff but i think it's very possible because i look you have uh coffin daffer doubting goal Yep. 
Do you understand that? That's a big deal. What I just said. Cock Cock and and dapper. dapper. Yeah. Saying goal doesn't feel like she's trustworthy. No. I I feel like at this point it's pretty obvious that um there's something corrupt here. It's pretty apparent. Something is corrupt here. I I I would literally bet money on it that there's something corrupt going on in this uh county and city. Um there's an issue. I I don't know who started it. It could have been anybody in the police force or law enforcement that started it. And it feels like a cover up thereafter. So one thing that I wanted to mention real quick is what I, I I wonder if we should um, watch it because I'm curious your take on it, but McClelland was not the prosecutor on this case when it first happened. It was another guy. And I saw uh, Jules of All Trade, shout out to her, play that interview and talk about it. And I found that very intriguing um, because he acts like they had so much evidence, so much evidence. He's like, we thought this was a piece of cake. We were going to have it solved in a week. And I was like, what? How could you walk up to that where a girl's body is drained of blood? And there's like symbols and think we got this in a week. That would scream like, oh my gosh, this is like Zodiac killer. <laughs> you know, like yeah. this is scary. This is scary. He said he, they weren't even that concerned about the disappearance of Abby and Libby at first. Like, oh, two kids went missing. Oh, they're probably all right. They're just lost in the woods. I mean, that shows their uh, lack of experience. Well, that's what he said. inability to He's... effectively manage, you know, as a police force. Yeah. Well, I agree. It his interview was extremely concerning t- for me. And I don't know. I just I feel like there's a major issue here. I feel like there's some kind of tight knit interconnectedness among officials in this area that is problematic. And I want to know where Odinism Patrick Westfall and Brad Holder fit into that equation because there has to be a connection of why they protected these men, because that's what I see not serving search warrants when you did tons of other people. Tons of other people got search warrants on their phones and their like property and all kinds of things. And they were suspects three days in. How did they get on their radar three days in? I, and the interviews are gone. No search warrants were served. What? I don't understand. I don't get it. I really don't. I have no clue. Something's up. Something's up. Somebody is related up. to somebody. Somebody owes somebody a favor. Somebody's got blackmail. Something is up. Yep. Why did the first judge judge step off the case? Was it blackmail to get a a special judge on the case? Right. I'm just just saying. I'm just saying. And we know that Odinism is not just located in Delphi. It is an Indiana thing. Like most of these guys lived in Rushville. Yes. Or yeah. went to Rushville to hang out and do things. Like, Absolutely. It is a statewide thing, especially looking into the Vinlanders and, and you know, skinhead gangs and stuff. There's, It's not just this area. It is Indiana. Yeah. There is a particular problem in Indiana with this kind of thinking. So I'm curious what you guys think about this. Um You know, one interesting thing also that I want to mention real quick is that I have heard over and over there was DNA found at the scene, but it is nowhere. I found a blog a long time ago where supposedly there was some kind of interview where DNA was mentioned early on in the case. And and then they were asking the question, like, what happened to the DNA evidence? Why is that not being talked about in Richard Allen's case? Like... And then I heard somebody say, well, they said it was um, not testable, like it was too degraded or something like that. The girls' bodies were found pretty quickly. Yeah. So I don't know. 
I don't know. I was that destroyed too. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting question, but I, I really hope they take this up the chain again. Um, I know Allison Mata from Defense Diaries said that they'd have to do an appeal. Not they couldn't probably take this to the Supreme Court again to get Judge Gull off the case. Yeah, they got to ask you. You have to give a judge. Uh, on most in most situations and most requests uh and 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 everything you have to always ask twice i don't know why that is but like with everything you got to give a you got to appeal it and give the judge a chance to change their opinion before you go above their head right but the supreme court like for, i don't know i don't remember her explanation i'm not a lawyer but apparently doing an interlocutory appeal or whatever it, is the next step so I, I wonder if they can just get it changed to a totally different county, like somewhere else, different judge, different everything. Special prosecutor, get rid of the prosecutor, get rid I of just, anybody connected to Delphi. I just don't understand how it's okay to have him in prison. No, I don't. And I feel like I don't understand that. Either. I feel like that should give the in for the DOJ to enter this scene like. Well, yesterday. I don't under understand how the Supreme Court didn't grant him relief in that and put him in a county jail. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> this it's so frustrating for me. Like, it's such a big problem. Um, and it is frustrating because the victims like it, it yeah. is such a circus and it is such a lack of accountability. And this is literally the. Our great work around the war on drugs, this is this is the outcome of it. We have a justice system that's been militarized in a way where they're not used to being questioned. Well, and the good old boys club, as I think what's going on here, too. It is totally a good old boys club, in my opinion. I think yeah. that's part of the problem here. I, is, and it's I the think problem. it's a good old boys club. I think these are just gang members. It's a small town, though, and I think there may be that added element, but I don't... I don't know, man. It's just scary. It's really scary. Like, super scary. It's actually kind of terrifying. And this was one of the most horrendous murders, I think, of, like, our generation. One of the worst. Period. What happened to these little girls. And whoever did it needs to be held accountable. Whether that's Richard Allen or that's the other alleged people. But yep. I want to know what you think. So definitely leave it in the comments. If you have any suggestions, theories, ideas, I want to hear them. Um, yeah, because that's what Thought Right Podcast is all about.